Good morning and welcome to Gateway Online. We are so glad that you're joining us this morning. Hey, I'm Pastor Jason Crabtree. Uh, and like many of you know, we had made the plan to open up on June 19th to reopen um, following all the CDC guidelines, all those things that we hear so much about. Um, but as numbers continue to climb and as safety and health has been a number one priority in regards to how we're going to move forward as a church, we've decided to postpone those things. Um, but we're excited because that Sunday uh, on June 19th we're going to have another prayer night and, and several weekends to come right after that we're going to have many events a, a family movie night um, and so we really want to encourage you to continue um, to be involved to continue to stay connected um, and as we talk about staying connected uh, we want to encourage you if you are new hey fill out that connection card let us know how we can pray for you um, also, if you want to give, you can give online or through the app, gatewaybysaya.com. I want to encourage you to do that. Also, don't forget, if you're a family, you have kids sixth grade and under, we have a service at 945 um, right here on Facebook, on YouTube, on, on the website. And so you can connect with us that way. Uh, we'd love for you to worship together as a family. You know, as we continue this series, Who is God? I'm excited uh, because the more we learn about God, the more we learn about who we are and how that relationships work. Um, and, and what's so cool about a relationship is that we give each other worth, we give each other value. And that's what we're gonna do right now as we worship the Lord. Let's worship together. Welcome, Gateway. Thank you for joining us online this morning. Let's go ahead and worship together. Thank you. 
Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Almighty
Hey, it's great to be back with you. We had a little uh, staycation. We took some time off, figured why not? We're uh, meeting online anyway, and we didn't do much veying. We mostly, we mostly did staying, staycation, not vacation, and, and uh, got a few things done around the house. But I want to thank uh, Pastor Lance and Pastor Jason for doing such a great job 
on the topic and subject of who is God? Uh, what are the attributes of God? What is, what is he like? What is his character composed of? And Pastor Lance and Pastor Jason did a great job uh, with that. And today we're going to talk about uh, who is God? What's he like? And I'm going to bring a different aspect of that. Uh, you know, we look across the landscape of our culture and uh, everything changes. Culture always changes. It never stands still. It's always shifting and, and moving. Culture is constantly changing. And we look at our culture today, and there's a lot of opinions out there of what matters. Uh, there's a lot of opinions uh, out there of what our culture is like and, and, and what we represent in our culture. And, and the thing that is probably most prevalent in the culture wars that are going on today is the anger. Uh, there is an enormous fountain of anger out there at different uh, things. Uh, I can identify with that. I, I grew up, I was an angry person. My mom used to love to tell me the story of when I was about three, three and a half years old. Our uncle, My uncle Harry, my dad's brother, was staying with us and my dad had given him this task to go out and change a couple of boards on the fence that were dry rotted and uh, put those up and paint them with the red stain that my dad had put on the fence. So I'm out in the backyard with my uncle Harry. He's got a hammer, a few nails, a can of red stain, and a paintbrush. And he changes the board, lays down the hammer. I pick up the hammer. I'm playing with it, and he's painting uh, the fence, and he gets to the bottom. He's kind of crouched down, and, he, and he's painting the bottom of that fence with the red stain, and he looks at me, and I have on this pair of uh, blue denim overalls. Uh, my mom said I used to love to wear those everywhere. I wanted to wear them every day. If you have kids, you know how they get addicted to clothing. They want to wear the same thing all the time. And I had, these, I had these overalls, and I'm out there with my hammer playing around. And my Uncle Harry took that paintbrush and took some of that red stain, and he just reached over because I'm standing right next to him, and he, and he puts a puts a mark, a red stain right on my favorite overalls. And I took that hammer, and I hit my Uncle Harry right in the forehead with it. <laughs> <laughs> and he jumped up, he went in the house, and he started telling my mom, your kid did this, and your kid did that, and finally she got out of him what he had done to me, and, you know, she just kind of laughed and said, well, maybe you deserved it, you know. Uh, but, but anger was just a part of my character uh, growing up, and then I became a Christian. Well, what are you going to do, you know, at 19 years of age, you become a follower of Christ and you're an angry person. What are you going to do with that? And I heard a sermon when I first became a Christian uh, in James 1, 19. Uh, Brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And very early on in my Christian life, I said, I don't like this being a Christian thing means i got to change. My character has to adjust. I, I, I have to do things differently because if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I cannot achieve the righteousness of God through anger. That was a great disappointment. That was one of the first verses I ever memorized. Wrote it down, taped it to my mirror. I'd see it every morning right there in the bathroom on the mirror. And, and I memorized that verse right away. And I, I'd go back to it constantly because anger is a battle. Uh, when you're an angry person, it's just ongoing all the time. Uh, Jesus uh, was dealing with his culture. There were a lot of angry people in Jesus' culture. There were a lot of Romans who had come in and taken over the uh, laws and the authority and the culture of Israel. And there were a lot of angry people about that. And, and Jesus said, you know, if you're going to strive after the kingdom of God, you're going to have to deal with some internal things. And he starts the Sermon on the Mount with a thing called the Beatitudes. Now, there's nine Beatitudes, but I'm only going to deal with three this morning. I'm going to deal with the middle three uh, because they are key to our story. So it says that Jesus saw the crowds at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, just before he gives the Beatitudes, and he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, he opened his mouth, and he began to teach them, saying, and he's going to do the Beatitudes. But I want to give you a little context uh, first. Why, why does the Bible say these things? He went up on the mountain. Why, why did Matthew think that was important? Who cares if he's teaching on a mountain or in a valley or on a flat plain or sitting on a rock or sitting in a boat? Why, why does the Bible say this stuff? Well, because who else went up on a mountain? Moses went up on a mountain. Why? 
Why would Moses go up on a mountain? Well, he met with God. Uh, Moses formed a nation. Uh, uh, Moses taught people how to live. Moses set up the sacrificial system. Moses set up the priests. Uh, Moses led the people through the wilderness and the desert between Egypt and Israel and almost into the promised land. But the one thing that Moses did is he taught people how to connect with God and he gave them a way to do it. And Jesus went up on a mountain to emulate what Moses did, yet in a different way. And so Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, and he's going to tell people how to connect with God in a healthy way. He's going to teach them uh, how do you become like God. And one of the things he deals with in the Beatitudes is a thing called righteousness. And that's what we're talking about today, the righteousness of God. What is God like? Who is God? What are, what are his character traits and his attributes? One of them is righteousness, how to become uh, righteous like God. Well, what is righteousness? Uh, It is a complete absence of moral evil. It is lacking the motivation to do evil. A complete possession of that which is morally and uh, holiness. Uh, God is righteous. God doesn't have a list of rules. These are the rules of righteousness, and I, God, keep those rules. No, God is righteousness. Uh, He totally uh, encompasses and is righteousness. He will never do anything outside of his character because he is total righteousness. He always does the right thing at the right time in the right way with the right people. Uh, He is righteous. In the Old Testament, the word for righteousness is tzedek, Tzedek, it means righteousness. If you see the word righteousness in the Old Testament, it's tzedek. Or if you see the word justice, uh, same thing, tzedek. It's two different, we translate it different ways into English because we have more words for righteousness. In Hebrew, it's just called uh, tzedek. In fact, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 says, All his ways are justice of God of faithfulness without iniquity, just and right. He uses the word Tzedek, three times. Just and right are the word tzedek, justice. He is total justice. He is uh, morally, ethically uh, righteous. In the New Testament, it's the Greek word uh, dikaios, is righteousness or justice. And God is called righteous in the New Testament as well. In fact, in Romans 3, verse 25, God displayed Jesus publicly on a cross. This was to demonstrate God's righteousness. That God couldn't just dismiss sin, that God had to give a sacrifice to sin, and Jesus was that sacrifice. And so to fulfill the righteousness of God, that sin just can't be dismissed, it has to be paid for. Jesus paid for our sin in order to satisfy the righteous character of God because he cannot violate his character or his standards. A sacrifice has to be given. God is righteous, therefore Us being righteous, us developing godliness is important because we want to be like God. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be righteous. And so back, let's go back to Matthew 5. Jesus is on this mountain. He's teaching the people. He's starting into the Beatitudes, and he gets to Beatitude number uh, 4, and Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. Uh, That word blessed is uh, makarios in the Greek. It it means God's favor rests upon. Blessed. God's favor rests upon those who hunger and who thirst. The most basic core motivations and desires uh, of our inner person is to eat when we're hungry and to drink when we're thirsty. The first thing an infant does is display, I'm hungry, and wants to and wants to eat. It is the most basic human need. It is the most core need in our lives. God's favor is upon uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. God's favor is upon, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's right in the middle of the Beatitudes. Nine Beatitudes. Mercy is number five, right in the middle. Uh, God's favor is upon, blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. We're going to deal with those three Beatitudes today. Uh, But Jesus is saying, how do you connect with God? Uh, How do you connect with God in a culture that is at war with God? Uh, How do you connect when you live in the intersection of evil and righteousness? You live right at the intersection of hate and mercy. You live right at the intersection uh, of of the debauchery of our culture and the purity of God's plan for our lives. We live in that intersection. Uh, Intersections are great. Uh, If you have people that follow the rules, they stop at the stop sign, they yield when the sign says to, they watch the stoplights, But boy, you find some people that ignore the rules and all of a sudden intersections allow for disasters. There can be disasters. People can get injured, even killed. Uh, Lawsuits. Lawyers love intersections. Man, there's all kinds of opportunities uh, with intersections. You know, I was reading one of my favorite authors, James uh, Dobson, Dr. James Dobson, uh, taught at USC's Keck uh, Medical School at one point point in time and, and started an organization called Focus on the Family. But, but, but he has talked for 50 years about culture and how culture is shifting and changing. And uh, he's had his you know, finger on the pulse of culture for a long time. And, and I've read a lot of the stuff that he has written. And, and he talks about how when we stand up for righteousness, oftentimes uh, we create uh, anger because we're saying to people, hey, maybe there's a right and wrong in life. And culture today wants to make everything relative. It uh, doesn't matter. As long as you're okay with what you're doing, who am I? Uh, and we have this culture war uh, going on uh, today. Uh, and there's a lot of anger. How do we connect with God during the culture wars? Well, let's, let's look at these three Beatitudes, very quickly. God's favors upon those who pursue the most basic need. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. Their number one vision is righteousness. Uh, you know, if you, if you uh, surveyed 100 people, you know, you probably would never even get anybody to see. If you said, what's your basic core need in life? I, I, I mean, survey 100 people, not one person is going to say, my biggest need is is righteousness. And God says we need to make this our most fundamental, deepest desire, hunger and thirst for it. You know, people in Israel understood hunger and thirst. You live in a, in a largely desert area. You really understand thirst. David wrote a psalm about thirst. He said, as a deer pants for the water, so God my soul pants for you. I mean, it was a fan, phenomenal picture of how much we are to uh, internally thirst for God, thirst for God's involvement uh, in my life. Uh, we like to be treated with righteousness. We want to be treated with righteousness. Uh, I go to the grocery store and I buy a pound of hamburger. I don't expect to get home and weigh it myself and find out that it's a half a pound of hamburger. Uh, I go get my oil changed and it Uh, The manual calls for five quarts of oil, and I get home to find out he put in five pints of oil. I I don't like that. I I want righteousness. I go and I sign a contract for a $200,000 house, and I get to the bank to sign the loan documents, and all of a sudden it says $225,000. I want righteousness. I get on a scale to weigh myself in the morning, yeah, that's no good. Lie to me. Just lie to me. I don't, wanna, I don't want righteousness in my scale. Uh, but all those other things, uh, I, want, uh, I want righteousness. We are, to, we are to treat righteousness with a hunger and a thirst. God, uh, what do you say about the way I should live? God, what do you say about how I, what I need to possess internally so I live right and treat people right and, and deal with people? Uh, in a way. Righteousness covers every aspect of relationship, telling the truth, being honest and open, caring about people's feelings. If I'm, if I'm righteous, I need to uh, treat people in a way that I would want to be treated. In fact, that, that's what Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And I should be, and, and if I 
if I hunger and thirst for righteousness, I'm going to be satisfied. If I hunger and I eat, I'm satisfied. There's a point of satisfaction where I go, oh, I'm full. I'm stuffed. Thanksgiving dinner. You know, this word satisfied literally means to fill to the point of almost being bloated. And Thanksgiving dinner is a great representation of that. You know, we get together and we eat turkey and stuffing and and gravy. Gravy is the best part. I could just I could just take a tablespoon and just have a meal just out of the gravy. I just love you know, gravy at Thanksgiving, and, and we sit back and we watch football and we go, oh, man, am I full to the point of just being totally, you know, satiated and satisfied. And yet, four hours later, <laughs> you know, we're back at the table for turkey sandwiches. Uh, you know, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, and then Jesus says God's favor is upon those who pursue the goal, which is to be Merciful. The entire goal of living is to be merciful. Jesus puts it right in the middle. Righteous people are merciful people. Righteous people are forgiving people. Uh, They know how to deal with others in a way in which they gain forgiveness and give forgiveness. Jesus says at the end, of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, uh, you need to treat them. This is the law and the prophets. The law. Law is a bunch of laws. How to be righteous. You want to be righteous? Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. Mercy. You know, rabbis, the rabbis of Israel during Jesus' time had a rule. You, You can be merciful three times. You can forgive three times. And, and, and Peter asked Jesus one time, he, he goes, boy, I'll tell you what, I'll be better than these other disciples around here. And he says to Jesus, hey, Jesus, uh, how about instead of like the rabbis, how about if we forgive people, how about if we're merciful, three plus three plus one, how about if we're merciful seven times? Wow, three times? and double it, and then add one for good measure? (laughs) And Jesus says, Peter, listen, if it's a mathematical formula you want, uh, forget about the three plus three. Uh, Forget about the seven times. Uh, You forgive Peter seven times, times 70 more. You know, Peter probably felt pretty good at first. Seven times. Yeah, times 70 more. And Peter probably took a little while to calculate that up in his head. And he just went, well, that's totally unreasonable, Jesus. How in the world? Hey, Peter, righteous people who hunger and thirst for righteousness are merciful people. Uh, They forgive people. They go uh, the distance. A forgiven person knows how to be forgiving, Peter. And then thirdly, we connect with God as we intersect with our culture uh, through the idea of purity in heart. Blessed blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Now, that word pure is an interesting word. It's, it's the Greek word katharos. We get our, our English word cathartic from that word. Uh, katharos was used uh, when there was no chaff left in the wheat. Uh, you know, you'd thresh the wheat, you'd throw it up, all the chaff would blow off and the seeds would drop. And, and when you brought a bag of wheat, of grain to be ground into flour, it, you had a really good bag of wheat when it was katharos, without chaff. It had no admixture. It wasn't polluted with the chaff. It was pure grain. You had katharos. When you brought uh, olive oil, a, 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 a container of olive oil to someone. Uh, you could bring an olive oil that was katharos. It didn't have any of the sediment and the residue of the crushed olive pits in the oil. It was pure oil. It was katharos. It was out without admixture or pollution. Uh, when you brought uh, wine to someone, you could bring wine that was katharos, or you could bring wine that uh, had water added to it. 
When you brought a wine that was katharos, it meant it was total wine and pure. No water had been added uh, to it. Uh, when you had uh, Jesus teaches that he is the vine dresser and he cuts, he cuts the vines because there were vines that were katharos. Uh, they were without, or excuse me, they were not katharos because they were without fruit. And so, uh, you know, we get the English word cathartic. And we have these cathartic moments when we purge ourselves of the sediments of the corruption of our culture. Uh, when we purge ourselves from the bad attitudes and the uh, bad character traits and the, and the anger and the difficulties that, that we have in our own lives. And we are katharos when we, when we purge those out of our lives. There's a great movie called Ordinary People. It was made, I don't know, 30, 35 years ago. Uh, but there is a, a boy named Buck who is with his younger brother. And, and they are on a boat in Lake Michigan. And there's a giant storm. And, uh, and, the, and the brother Conrad is holding on to Buck and holding on to the mast. And all of a sudden, Buck slips away. Uh, he's, got his, he's got his forearm, and he, and he just slips away. Conrad survives, and Buck drowns. Conrad feels horrible. He thinks it's his own fault. Survivor's guilt. I let my brother drown. And he goes to counseling. And right at the climax of the movie, he's with his counselor, his psychologist, and, and he's having this moment of just reliving what took place on the sailboat in the storm and how that Buck had slipped away from his grip and, and he's crying and there's tears and he's, 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 he's just hysterical. And, and finally, in the climax of that moment, the counselor says to Conrad, did you ever think that maybe it was him that couldn't hold on to you? And in that moment... Conrad is able to release uh, the thing that had been polluting his soul, uh, the guilt that had been weighing on him, uh, that I couldn't hang on to my older brother, and yet all of a sudden now it's, the table is turned and he can release uh, that guilt, and his soul is purified and it's healed in that uh, moment. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart because they hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. They'll be satisfied. Satisfied people, full people, uh, are able to be merciful. Forgiven people know how to forgive. And it purifies their heart. And one day, because they are seeking to live like one of God's attributes and character traits, they'll see God face to face. Well, so what? What difference does any of that make? In fact, let's say that together. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. So what? Let me give you three quick things of how this should impact me today. How do I incorporate these three beatitudes in this culture war that's creating anger everywhere we go? Well, number one, righteousness is a vision towards action. It's a vision towards action. Righteousness is not self-righteousness. Look how wonderful I am. Look how I never do this and never do that. I just stand in this place and I am a rock of righteousness. No, no, no. Righteousness is an action. Uh, hunger and thirst. That's an action. Every four hours, I hunger and thirst. Okay, every hour, I hunger and thirst. I, I'm always putting stuff in my mouth, drinking coffee or tea or water or soda. I'm, I'm always thirsty. I'm always hungry. I'm always looking. I'm, I'm taking action uh, all the time. Uh, you know, hunger and thirst is an action. Uh, my wife and I will be having breakfast and I'll say, what's for lunch? You know, and we'll be having lunch and I'll say, what's for dinner? And we'll get to dinner and I, I'm thinking, what's for dessert? You know, what are we going to have for a snack? It's an action. Righteousness is an action. Righteousness is not a withdrawal from culture. Righteousness is an action toward culture. How can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I point you to a relationship with God which might help your anger, might help your problems, 
in life, might help you deal with people, maybe in a way that values them a little more. Because our secular culture has said people don't matter. They're just evolutionary descendants. They don't have a soul. There is no God. Well, maybe in our righteousness we can take actions that, that woo people, that help people uh, connect with God so it can make a difference in their soul. So maybe they can purge some of the things out of them. Secondly, mercy is a goal towards restraint. Mercy is a goal towards restraint. You know, grace is God giving us something we don't deserve. For God so loved the world, he gave. That's grace. Mercy is withholding from us what we do deserve. God in his mercy withheld judgment through Christ. Mercy is withholding uh, what we do deserve. Jesus on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Gave us mercy. Withhold from them what they deserve. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. My wife used to say this to me when our kids were doing stuff that I didn't want them to do. And they're misbehaving or throwing a fit. And I'd wait in there to give, straighten them out and fix. And my wife would say, Father, <laughs> forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, uh, that was a, that's a great application to that verse. Finally, thirdly, purity. Purity is an idea without contamination. Uh, a pure heart, for they shall see God. It, it's kind of a prayer. Uh, God... Help me to be uh, the purest form of Jesus I can be. Help me not to take Jesus and add a bunch of stuff to him. Help me not to take Jesus and pollute what he is really like, but help me take Jesus and be the purest form of Jesus to my culture, to my family, to, to the, the people that are struggling about what matters in our world. Father, help me to be the purest form of Jesus I can be. Help me to hunger and thirst for righteousness because forgiven people can be forgiving. And help me add nothing to Jesus uh, so that I can be the righteousness of God to my world. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity we have today to take your word and apply it in such a relevant way to our lives. Help us to be Jesus to our world. There's a lot of things we can be angry about. Uh, there's a lot of anger flowing uh, through the television set and the radio. And Father, you call us to be a bridge from our culture and our world into your kingdom. People are never, Father, condemned into heaven. People are loved into heaven. God, you so love the world you gave. And so, Father, we ask that we would love our world. We'd be righteous and merciful and a purest form of Jesus we can be. You know, as we're praying, as our eyes are closed, maybe you've never connected with God. I hope you'll do that today. If, if you'd like to do that, I'm going to say a prayer out loud. And you can pray this prayer silently or out loud if you wish. And you can say, Dear Father, thank you that Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid for all of my sin. I put my total trust and faith in him for eternal life. Help me to learn to be like Jesus. In his name, amen. Thanks for being with us today, Gateway. I hope you go out and change the world by being like Jesus. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so glad that you're connecting with us here at Gateway Online. You know, if you made a decision today to put your faith and trust in Christ, man, we are so proud of you and we're so happy for you. And we want to resource you. So make sure you fill out the connection card, follow the link here, or also go to gatewayvisaya.com. There's a link there as well. Um, also, I want to encourage, we know there are a lot of people that are hurting. There are a lot of people 
that are, that are confused during this time. We want to pray for you. So make sure you go and you let us know how we can pray for you. And maybe, hey, if God's been doing amazing things, there's also a place where you can share your story. We'd love to rejoice with that with you. So make sure you stay connected. Again, there's so many things happening this week. Uh, we got Gateway Takeout, another great couple of restaurants. So make sure you stay connected with that. Gateway Midweek, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Hey, we're talking about how do I study the Bible? And so we're excited for that conversation. Man, Gateway, we miss you to death, but we love you so much. We're, we're praying for you, and we want to encourage you during this time. Hey, God has got you. This is nothing new to him. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pastor Jason. Hey, have a blessed week.